Okay, so in this last video, um, I just want to go over um, this kind of PowerPoint I made uh, called Additional Slides of Fun. That's pretty great, huh? Um, let's see here. I want to do full screen here. Okay. The last video concluded with the discussion of the demand curve and how it was graphically derived from the series of indifference curves and budget constraints. Um, if not to um, take, the, take this a step further, uh, this last video, what it's going to talk about is when the price changes along the demand curve. We know we have an increase in the quantity demanded, for instance, when the price falls. But I want to highlight the fact that actually two things are going on. Now, we know from the last section of this course that um, we said that the demand curve was downward sloping because of the law of diminishing marginal utility. And we kind of left it at that at that point. But there's actually two things that are going on here. And those two things that are going on are the substitution effect and the income effect. Okay, so if the price is falling, quantity demanded is increasing. We know that, so bullet one here would be the law of demand. Uh, duh moment. Um, but then actually what's happening are two things. First, in the case of the substitution effect, what's happening is that as the price falls, we tend to substitute towards that good because it is now cheaper, relatively speaking. But then second, there's an income effect. And this, uh, this deals with the fact that um, although my income hasn't gone up when the price has fallen, um, the purchasing power of my income has increased. By purchasing power, what we mean is that my income can buy a certain number of products. Well, it can buy more of those products if the price of those products has decreased. So I'm going to feel richer, even though I'm not really richer. That's going to be our income effect. So both of these are going to be happening whenever the price is changing. Okay. Um, I don't think I need to, to talk about this any further. Um, again, substitution effect is dealing with the fact that the relative price has changed, so you buy more of that good that is now relatively cheaper. Income effect, buy more of the good when we feel richer. And in the case of the substitution effect, what we're saying is that we're holding the level of utility constant. Um, and it must always, always be the case. This is an incredibly important part right here. I don't think I can highlight it. But this part here is, is quite important. It must always, always be the case that when the good is cheaper, relatively speaking, that you must buy more of it. I was very particular in the words I chose there. Cheaper, relatively speaking. So cheaper relative to the other goods that I could purchase. I will always buy more of it. Now, in the case of the income effect, we're going to see that that's not always going to be the case. Now, in the case of the income effect, rather than holding the level of utility constant, which is what we did for the substitution effect, now I'm going to hold the price of the item constant. And what we see here is that it's going to be different depending on whether they are normal goods or inferior goods. In the case of the normal good, the income effect, I'll buy more of it, right? Because if I feel richer, I certainly will buy more of it. But in the case of the inferior good, where the substitution effect is always working in this direction, in the case of the inferior good, I actually buy less of the good when I feel richer. Remember, inferior goods are things like taking the bus or ramen noodles, things that are goods that you only purchase really because of the income levels that you have. And if your income levels were to go up, you would buy less of it or vice versa. But in the case of the inferior good, you would have remembered that the demand curve was still downward sloping. We didn't draw a different shape demand curve just because it was an inferior good. And the reason why was because the income effect, although it was working in the opposite direction, was not enough to overcome the very strong substitution effect. So that overall, and that's what this last column here is denoting, is that the demand curve is still downward sloping. Even though in the case of the inferior good, 
the income effect is slightly over um, coming that. Okay, now this is this is primarily the reason why I made uh, this into uh, a document that we could all look at jointly here. Um, I take a deep breath because it is a little bit complicated here. Um, let's look at the normal good, where we have the income and substitution effect. Okay, so a lot of things going on here, but let's look at what our where our normal our our initial budget constraint is this from R to S. That's our original um, budget constraint. Okay, this red line right here, U1, is our original indifference curve. So I'm at U1, just touching budget constraint RS, the, the dark blue line, with my optimal point being A. So that's where I started off. That's where all this begins. And now we're going to lower the price of food, the good on the x-axis. The act of lowering the price of food changes my budget constraint now to R. T, so this dashed blue line, making my new indifference curve U2, and my new optimal point B. Now, if we were to draw out the demand curve below this, what we would see is points A and B, right? the ultimate change. Basically what we want to do here in this set of PowerPoints, well, in this PDF document, is break down those changes two things going on, the income effect and the substitution effect. So here's what we're trying to do again. A to B, that's the total change that we're seeing from lowering the price of food. The first thing that happens is a substitution effect. Caused by, right, er, what we're trying to do is hold the level of utility constant. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to draw a new line that's parallel exactly to my new budget constraint, RT. We're going to draw it inward until it just touches the original indifference curve. Why is that? Remember that the substitution effect says we're holding the level of utility constant. So we draw in a new line just parallel to the original RT line. You keep drawing it in until it's this, I don't know what kind of color that is, light blue, <laughs> very light purple, until it just touches U1, which would be at point D. A to D is our substitution effect. Now what we say is that we allow ourselves to be on the higher indifference curve, and we hold the price level now constant. That takes us from D to be. Income effect, substitution effect, total effect. Okay, now in the case of the inferior good, the first thing to note is that the income effect is going to slightly um, reduce my substitution effect, but that the total effect is still working in a direction where we buy more of a good as the price falls. Now, again, RS is our original budget constraint, U1 is our original indifference curve, meaning point A is our optimal point. The price of food falls, making my budget constraint now RT. Indifference curve is now U2, making my new optimal point B, meaning I'm moving from A to B. Now, substitution effect. I draw a line that's just parallel to my new budget constraint, and I draw it inward until it just touches U1. As I draw it inward, it would touch at point D. And then the income effect would say we now allow the price, uh, we now allow the utility level to change. We're going to hold the price level constant. That brings us to B. A to D to B, income effect slightly um, reducing the substitution effect, but that the overall effect is negative, as it should be for the demand curve. Now, there is one exception, and that's the Giffen good. 
The Giffen good is an extremely rare good. Uh, people would spend, uh, for some 150 years, people spent their entire careers looking for Giffen goods. And in fact, this is actually a pretty unique time in economic history that we finally have found a Giffen good. A Giffen good is a good that is basically a really inferior good. It is so inferior, in fact, that the income effect actually overwhelms the substitution effect. Meaning, okay, get ready for economic craziness here, is that in the case of the Giffen good, the demand curve is actually upward sloping rather than downward sloping. Um, for there to be a Giffen good, you would basically have to have a good where there are very, very few substitutes. And you would have to have it, the good consuming a high percentage of the consumer's income. Um, uh, uh, basically, the, the only kind of way we can find this is if we um, find a staple good, a good that is so in some sense necessary um, that poor people buy, because in the case of this, poor people would spend then a significant amount of their income on this good. And so while all food prices are increasing, consumers still buy more of this um, good like bread, for instance, right? Because in the case of other foods increasing, bread is still the cheapest alternative. Okay. Uh, <laughs> if we'd been taking this class uh, 115 years ago, hey, around the time of the uh, founding of Stout, if I'm not mistaken, although it very well could be, right? So if we were here with uh, James Stout and we were taking this class and I, uh, we were taking this class online, uh, we would probably give this kind of quote. Right? I love this word. I don't know why. Farinaceous. It means to have a starch-like quality. Um, basically, Giffen was the guy who came up with this, uh, thought of this idea of the um, Irish potato famine, is what he had described. And for many years, Irish potatoes were considered, uh, during the Irish potato famine, which was uh, sort of a disease that hit potatoes in Ireland and um, in Ireland, uh, a lot of people relied on that food item uh, for their daily living, and people st ended up still buying more and more potatoes, even though the price was increasing, because it was still the cheapest alternative. Now, uh, let me before I go on, the problem with that, and it was disproved. Uh, uh, a few years later after Giffen had said this. The problem with that is that also the Irish, though, were the farmers, so they theoretically would have had increases in their income. So it wasn't a very good u good to use as an example of a Giffen good. Uh, so the Irish potato famine was the first cited um, Giffen good, but it quickly disappeared. Um, now, in terms of how this looks, you'll notice that the indifferent curves just look really screwed up. Um, they have basically, they're incredibly steep on the left-hand side and incredibly wide, the, div the divergence, incredibly wide on the right-hand side. Um, and what you see here, right, is this idea that um, the income effect actually overwhelms the substitution effect. Um, we would be starting off at E1, price of movie falls, which makes this budget constraint go outward to here, right? Uh, making E2 our new point, but if we, wanted to die, if we wanted to break down that, draw the line that's parallel to this new budget constraint, draw it inwards until it's at this line right here, and it would be touching at uh, E star. So E1 to E star would be our substitution effect. And then the income effect would overwhelm that. Okay, so then when we add this um, to our chart here, what we see is that the Giffen good is basically the really, really inferior good. So inferior that the income effect overwhelms the substitution effect, giving us an upward sloping demand curve. Um, now the reason why I said that this is this Giffen good, why we're in a historic time period, is because a good has actually been found. Um, if you look in your textbook, um, I think there's actually a description of it. They found that rice in a certain province of China 
is actually a uh, gift from good. So after many, many accounts spending their entire career looking for these gift and goods, one has finally been found, so you can rest easy tonight. Um, a gift and good has been found. Okay, um, that uh, concludes um, this chapter 9. Uh, again, one of the most difficult chapters in this course, and of course most difficult chapters in this section. Okay, so I'm going to stop the video here, and... Um, We'll probably end up uh, doing a quiz on um, pretty much nine and just the beginning of ten. So, um, but I'll make a video, a separate video about that quiz.